we praise you, Lord, that you do not give us a spirit of fear, but of love and sound. Of love and power and a sound mind. That's what you give. Oh, God, you're so good. You're so good. And we are yours, Lord. Jesus. Thank you. 
Tim, and I thank all of you guys for coming out. I thank uh, all the people that are going to be watching via technology. It's really crazy this season that we're in. They keep saying new normal, and I keep telling them to shut up. Um, it's, it's really crazy because folks are... Now, I, I don't know what's going on, so it's hard for me to, to speak to it. I just know that a lot of people aren't coming, and for whatever reason. Uh, but so many people are watching via Facebook and, and different methods of technology, a lot more than, than were. Uh, so it's, it's just strange. I, I'm not coping with it that well, I'll be honest about it. Praise God. I like to see people in here. I, I'm a, as, as anti-social as people think that I am, and I, I've been a loner my entire life, there's no doubt about that. I'm very comfortable all by myself. Uh, I still, I need human interaction. And I just can't make it without it. As much as, as, much as I avoid it, so often. I, I, I can't live without it. I don't know if that makes any sense to anyone. And see, that's one of the reasons that I really struggled when, when God started calling me to preach. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Preachers are nice people. And I'm not. I mean, I'm like, you know, don't ask me a question unless you want the truth. And I don't care if you like it or not. And that's just the way I am. And you know, it's not that I want to hurt people's feelings. I just hate lying. And I'm no good at skirting issues or being speaking with tact. I, I just, I'm direct. There you go. I'm just, I'm just brutally honest. And it's, it's not that it's not without love. The Bible says speak the truth in love, and I do. But people, they don't feel that love sometimes. But it's there. Trust me, it's there. But I, I want to take you tonight, we're, we're going to talk about miracles, miracles, miracles. We're going to spend our time, for the most part, in the book of Acts. I'm just going to read for quite a while, uh, starting in Acts chapter 6. In verse 8 it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders, did great wonders and signs among the people. In Acts chapter 9, verse 10, it says, Now there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell, fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. In Acts chapter 9, verse 32, it says, Now it came to pass as Peter went through all the parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So, so all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him 
and turn to the Lord. In Acts chapter 10, verse 36, it says, At Joppa there was a certain disciple, Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with him. When he came, uh, he brought, he, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments, garments which Dorcas had made while she was with him. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. Acts chapter 10 was a chapter recalling encounters with angels, visions, more outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 11, we see more souls added to the church, prophetic utterances concerning futuristic events. Acts chapter 12 recounts the supernatural deliverance of Peter and God's judgment upon a king that refused to give God glory. Interestingly enough, this is the king that began the per persecution of the church. And there is a verse in chapter 12 that is very encouraging anyone to whom the enemy has been harassing severely. Acts 12 and 24 says, But the word of God grew and multiplied. In Acts chapter 13, verse 4 says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They also had John, which is John Mark, as their assistant. Now, when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Father, you know how much help I need. You know, God. I don't have to tell you. You know. So help me. Help me say what you want said. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just recapping that would take months. I mean, there's just so much power that is demonstrated in the book of Acts. I mean, it's miracle after miracle. It's, it's, it's genuine revival. I mean, revival has broken out from Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit was poured out. And, and there's so many people today that believe that, that until you have been endued with this kind of power, you have not been truly baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to fuss with them or argue with them because that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, you shall be endued with power and you shall be my witnesses. And the thing that got so many people, so many people's attention was the power. I mean, there's incredible things happening. Incredible things happening. The dead are being raised. Paralyzed people are walking. Uh, people that are... Uh, Fighting the gospel are struck blind. Uh, this is some serious stuff that is taking place here. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit and they both were struck dead. I mean, this place is it's happening. And the question has to be asked. Who among us can be trusted with that kind of power? Because we're not going to see that kind of power until we can be trusted with it. These people can be trusted with it.
You remember, I, I know you do. Jesus had sent out the 12, and they had seen incredible miracles. So much so that when they returned to him, they, they weren't accepted in one city. And I believe it was John came up to Jesus and he said, Would you like me to call down fire from heaven upon them? Now, what kind of move of the Spirit had they experienced that John thought he could call fire down from heaven? Think about that. They considered themselves in such a place of authority that if they called fire down from heaven, it would fall. But Jesus pruned him right there. He cut off that wild branch. And he said, you are of, that's not the spirit we are of. I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I came to save them. See, that's the difference between the law and grace. The letter of the law kills. The spirit gives life. Amen. Jesus came to give life. He did not come to condemn the world, but that through him the world would be saved. God demonstrated man's fallen nature through the law. That's, that's what the law did. The law taught us that we were lost without God. And it was harsh and, 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 and brutal. But when Jesus came, the gears shifted. God said, here, let me have your hand and I will show you the way. Not only show you, but empower you. And give you the ability to live for me that you could have never have had any other way. And so these guys are, they're, they're walking in this. I mean, Paul is, he is calling down blindness on this wizard. This guy, Paul can obviously tell that the man he's ministering to is open to the gospel. And this, this false prophet, that Bar Jesus, is, is opposing him. And Paul just has enough, and he puts an end to it. And, and it doesn't hurt the ministry. Do you see what happens? The proconsul comes to Christ. He says, that is wow. Yeah, I believe. Who among us could be trusted with this kind of power? I've gotten angry with people cutting me off in traffic. I drove in Tulsa today, and I hate it. I'm just going to be honest. I, I am not cut out for Tulsa. It would help if any of those people could drive. One guy was literally driving right down the middle of the white line in the two lanes. He finally turns his blinker off and gets in the right lane. And I'm like, brother, you should have done that a long time ago. You don't have to drive a, a block and a half to get in the other lane. I've proven that many times as I have jerked to the right lane, shot ahead, jerked back to the left lane, shot ahead, jerked to the right lane, shot ahead, passing cars all the way. If it were legal, I would drive on the shoulder, but it's not, and I don't do it, and it, it's probably not legal, the things that I do. As a matter of fact, I'm reasonably certain it's not. I had a police officer one time in Oklahoma City that turned his lights on, but traffic was so heavy, I, they wouldn't even let me get pulled over. He finally just shook his finger at me, screaming some stuff through rolled down windows, and I went on. He did make me miss my turn. <laughs> But Ryan told me, he said, you know, you, you, you really have one major flaw, and it's your temper. And, and he said, it's not as bad as it used to be. <laughs> what would the world look like if all the things that I've said have come to pass? See, most people skim over these things. We don't really want to address this. We want to talk about the miracles. 
And I want to talk about the miracles. I'm expecting miracles. But who among us is going to be able to carry the weight of this? Because you understand that when we really begin to pray for the miraculous, you understand what's going to happen, don't you? The first thing that is going to happen is God is going to equip you to carry the weight. You are seeing everything that you are able to handle. You've heard, you've heard how many people that have operated and lived in revival, how many times have you heard them say, you are not waiting on God. God is waiting on you. That's what they're talking about. If God were to do everything that we've asked tonight, there would have to be a major shift in our lives. It would have to be, and God could do it. I'm not saying he can't do it. I'm going to look at some things later in the, in the sermon and show you that, that it, there's no pattern. There's no map here. Uh, I, I'm not going to give you 12 steps to get to where you need to be with God. I don't know what God is going to require of us. Neither did William Booth. And neither did John Kilpatrick. And neither did Finney. And neither did Seymour. None of these men knew what God was going to require before he came. But God required before he came. I want you to think about it. That Paul walked into a place where his mere words could strike blindness in another human being. Are we willing to live that crucified a life that God could trust us with such power? That we're not just going to get angry at some point. And spout off something. I'll have to stay out of Tulsa. And they cut me off. In Acts chapter 14, verse 8, it says, And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Said with a loud voice, Stand up on your feet! And he leaped and walked. What does it take to carry this kind of power? David Hogan had just went to the jungles of Mexico. He just arrived, and they brought to him this little five, I, I want to say little girl, but I can't remember if it was a girl or a boy. But, but these people are about four foot tall. I mean, they're tiny people. They live in houses, little, little huts, that are literally eight feet by eight feet. They're, the whole family lives in there, in these tiny little huts. And they bring this little child that is dying. He's about five years old. And it's dying. And David prays. And the child dies. And he said, I came to a conclusion right there. It was not those people's fault that the child died. They knew nothing about God. They, they had no understanding, no inclination, didn't know anything about God. He said it was not God's fault. It is never God's fault. He said so that only leaves one person in the equation. And so he fasted for the next 30 days. And then he fasted every other day for 30 days. And then he fasted for 30 days. And then he fasted every other day for 30 days. And then he fasted for 30 days. 
And then he fasted every other day for 30 days. And then he fasted for 30 days. And this went on for years. So when they bring David Hogan, a little baby that's dying, when he prays, God raises them up almost always. But he has done everything that he knows to do to carry the weight of that glory. And he will admit to you that not everyone gets healed. And, and, and he, here's his deal. He says, when I pray for them, if God heals them, we, we celebrate. He said, if they don't, I grab a shovel and I stay with the family until the, until the child or whoever is buried. Two of his grandsons, his own grandsons, have died. One was raised from the dead. They buried the other. I don't understand these things. But there is no doubt that David Hogan carries this kind of power. When we pray for huge miracles, the first thing that God is going to do is transform our character to where we can carry the weight. You stop and think about it. And, and I'm not saying that God won't have someone write a book. I'm not saying that at all. But if people start getting up out of wheelchairs, if people start leaving their walkers on the side of the church, if we start seeing the miraculous things that we, we've asked God for, it is highly likely that if we have not come to that place of crucifixion, if we have not come to that place of humility before God, we're going to, we're going to, just like uh, Glenn Melder was talking about, we're going to get Charisma Magazine in here, we're going to write books, we're going to try to get on everybody's television show, we're going to try to demonstrate, you know, show everybody what God is doing in Barnesdale. They've done it a hundred times, maybe a thousand. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be the person that commercializes the move of God. I don't want to be the person that writes a book to sell a million copies so I can retire with a big nest egg in my bank account. I just want to see God move. And move in a huge way. And live my life in a way that, that draws no attention to myself. But gives all the glory to him. I can't say that I'm there yet. Can we be trusted with this kind of power? Moses could. And one of the reasons that he could is found in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now the man of Moses was very meek above all the men that were upon the face of the earth. Moses wrote Numbers. And he wrote this about himself. Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. That's what he wrote about himself. I can't write that. And it be true. Can you? So how much power can God trust me with? How much power can God trust you with? These are legitimate questions, and I really have no idea what the answer is. But we are praying for incredible power. Legs to grow back on, veterans that have lost them in wars, hands, arms, the scars, the burns, all that damage healed and removed from bodies, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, and the dead raised to life again. That's what we've been praying that. And my dear friends, that is power. That's no ordinary power. And there's people who say that can't happen. But you're wrong. God can do these things. There was a man, I can't remember his name. I'm sure some of you can. He was in West Tulsa. He, he, he didn't even have an eyeball. He just had a socket. But he had 20-20 vision out of the socket. What was his name? Ronald Coyne. It wasn't that long ago. They could patch his good eye as best they could. They duct tape that thing closed. 
And he could read anything with a socket. What does God have to do to enable us to carry this kind of power? The word glory literally means weight, weightiness, heaviness. I've been talking to you in weeks past that we were designed to carry the presence of God. That's our job. We're a kingdom of priests. It was the Le Levitical priesthood that carried the Ark of the Covenant. That is a type and a shadow of who we are. We are the priests of God. And we are to carry His presence. We're to carry His weightiness. Now just how much of His weightiness can we carry? What transformation is necessary? And the real question is, are we willing to submit to God for this kind of change? Now, we've, we've got to get past the idea that this is going to feel good. And, and, and it's not mental torment. Uh, that's demonic. It's not sickness. That's demonic. But it's the cutting off of what I was talking about earlier. When we, when we get out in left field with something, it's allowing God to cut off wrong ideas. When we get a harebrained idea that, that we're to write a book, and I'm not saying that someone won't be called to write a book, but what I'm saying is when it's our idea to write a book, we've got to have that be willing to be cut off. If God tells us to write a book, it's an entirely different matter. Write the book. But here in Matthew 20 and 20, it says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on my right hand and the other on my left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Yeah. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. <laughs> At least I'm honest enough to say, I'm not sure. <laughs> but you got to understand, I have a lot of hindsight. I know they crucified Peter upside down. I know James, the brother of John, was killed with a sword. I know the beatings of Paul. I can't feel them, but I know about them. Stripes, imprisonment, shipwreck, snake bed, persecution. We are able. And he saith unto him, Ye shall, you shall drink indeed of my cup, <laughs> and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and that they are great, that, that they are, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, let him be your servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus didn't even grant their request, but he told them, oh yeah, you're going to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. And he's talking about his crucifixion. He's talking about the torment, in, 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 and I, torments may be a bad word, but the agony in Gethsemane. That's what he's talking about. And, and see, I have struggled with this for years. I've never really come to terms with it and understood it. But I think I have some understanding now. Paul spoke of this often. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. 
I want to read some more because I think maybe it will start making sense to you. Colossians 1 and 24 says in the in New King James, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. See, Paul is saying, I'm willing to go through whatever I have to go through in order that I carry the weight of glory on me that is necessary for the church to be built up. What did he say? He said, he said uh, the sufferings of Christ abound in me, but the consolation of Christ also. What did he say? He said, I want, I'm going to know him in the in the fellowship of his sufferings that I may know him in the power of the resurrection. Hang in there. See, if we want to know the power, we're going to have to know the suffering. Paul is not speaking of sickness or mental torment from the devil. He's speaking of all the persecution and beatings he endured for the gospel's sake. Remember that all the early disciples were persecuted horribly. There is a price to pay for such power. Heaven is paid for by Jesus, but any saint that God uses in incredible ways has paid a steep price. Yeah. Ryan and I were talking about this yesterday, and I had this thought. I asked Ryan, I said, have I asked God for more than I'm willing to pay for? And to be honest, I still don't know the answer to that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul makes this statement. He said, you are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I wish you could, you did reign, that we might also reign with you. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise as Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. It doesn't sound like Paul is having much fun there, does it? I mean, he says, God has displayed us. The apostles last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. See, I don't know the name of anyone else, that, and I know there's other names, but I don't know a single one in the letter to the Corinthians. I'm sure if I just sit and thought about it, I could come up with somebody that's in there. But I live by Pauline doctrine every day of my life. He wasn't having fun with it. It was difficult for him. But consider the weight of glory that God poured out upon him. A man that died 2,000 years ago, not Jesus. Now, certainly Jesus, he's affected me more than anybody. But I'm talking about just a man. Jesus is a man God. I can't explain that, so please don't ask me to try Two thousand years ago, this man felt like someone that was condemned to death. Felt like someone that God had laid on display as a spectacle. That men thought they were fools. That angels thought they were fools. But to this day, I apply what he wrote to my life. Deep impact has a deep price. Remember the words of Jesus. Whoever will come after me must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And from that day, the Bible says, many walked away. And I know this is a challenging word, but I want us to look at the results. People that are willing to live the crucified life have impacted this world in incredible ways. Early in 1727, there was a group of people in Hernhut in Saxony. And it's 
near Germany in Czechoslovakia. They began praying, came out of Czechoslovakia, ended up in Germany, began praying for a revival. By August of that year, 1727, 48 people in a village of 300 had covenanted, covenanted to pray one hour each a day. That they scheduled prayer for 48 free people covered, then they all prayed an hour. So there was two hour, two people praying every hour. There, there was 24 hour, seven days a week, 365 days a year prayer. 48, that there was 300 in the village. You should be encouraged. There's 1,200 of us here in Barnsdall. And there's people that are drawn from further regions than Barnsdall, Coffeeville, Claremore, Tulsa. But people that are watching all over this region and around the world. We have people uh, contacting us from around the world. 48 people covenanted to pray. Each prayed one hour, but they covered the full cloth. 24 7, 365. That round the, clock, round the clock prayer meeting lasted 100 plus years. 65 years after the prayer began, this tiny community of 300 people had sent 300 missionaries to the far corners of the world. They sent missionaries to this nation. We're still talking about the Moravian prayer movement. We still experience the power of the Moravian prayer movement that began in 17, well, it actually began in the 1400s. But it, it really earnestly, the prayer began 24 7, 365 in 1727. I want you to think about that. The price that these two people were willing to pay to carry what God desired they carry. His way, His glory for the entire world to see. Someone once said there is only one way to obtain more from God. God has to get more from us. William Booth, the captain of the Salvation Army, was asked what is your secret for the success that you have? He said, I do not know. <laughs> I love it. This, we're still talking about the man today. God used him so powerfully. And they asked him, what is the secret? I don't know. Perhaps. It is because there was a day in my life when I said to myself, God is to get all of William Booth. The year was 1921 when the news of a mighty revival began between the east coast of Scotland and Yarmouth, Yarmouth moved our hearts. Thousands of fishing villages were taken by this revival, and tens of thousands were being saved. During this time, a mighty hymn was born. The chorus goes like this. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. This work was mainly that of the Holy Spirit, but God chose two men as his tools. Jock Troop and Douglas Brown. Douglas Brown was a non-denominational minister of a flourishing church. He relates his story as follows. We probably need more than a meeting to get to the bottom of the truth. It took me personally four months, more than four months. I had been a minister of Jesus Christ for 26 years. But during one Sunday evening service, God touched me. He almost broke my heart while I was preaching. Afterwards, I went to the house. I locked the door, threw myself down in front of the fireplace with 
the broken heart. Why? I do not know. <laughs> my church was full. I loved my people. And I believe they loved me. I don't mean they had to. They just did. This was the place where I was happy to be for 17 years. There was not a Sunday without at least one conversion. Then one night, I went directly home to my study. My wife called me for dinner. Don't wait for me, I replied. She asked, what's the matter? I told her I was broken hearted. I did not eat that night. The Lord touched the proud minister and told him that there is no holding back if you are to fully yield yourself to him. I knew what he meant. I knew what it meant for me. But I was not ready yet to pay the price. I went into my room not to sleep but to spend the whole night in prayer. The next morning when I left my room, I stumbled over the dog. He must have thought I was ill. When the dog whimpered away, I felt as though I did not deserve to be loved. Not even by my dog. I felt rejected. Then something happened. I felt the loving embrace of Jesus. And all his power, love, and blessing flood through me. God had waited for four months in order to gain a man like me. What was the secret of this man's mighty service and the following revival where tens of thousands were converted? He humbled himself. David Hogan fasted and prayed. This man was a successful minister, and it just took four months for God to break him. But he didn't see the move of God until God, until he humbled himself unto God. See, it's only through full surrender was Abraham's blessing, the blessing of the whole world. It can happen for us if we do the same. Abraham God spoke to him and said, leave your family, leave your country, do what I tell you to do. And the Bible tells us Abraham packed his bags and he left. You remember the story some 25 years later, Abraham had finally had the promised child. And I don't know how many years after that, Isaac was growing, he was flourishing, and God said, I want the boy. Give me the boy. Kill the boy. And one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, it says early the next morning, Abraham got up. He gathered the wood for the sacrifice. Gathered the animals. And he took off for a mountain that God didn't even tell him where it was at. See, Abraham just did what God told him, even though he didn't know what he was telling him. William Booth really didn't know why God used him so much. He thought maybe it was because one day he said, God's going to get all there is of William Booth. This man we spoke of just now spent four months trying to find that place of total surrender. And when he did... God used him to save tens of thousands of people. We're asking God for huge things. I'm not sure one man can carry it. As a matter of fact, I'm reasonably certain one cannot. You that are watching via technology, do you want to see this city burning for Jesus? Do you want to see this city turned upside down for Christ? Do you want to see this region ablaze for the glory of God? Do you want to see the state of Oklahoma in revival? Do you want to see the United States of America experience the greatest awakening? Then you just got to ask yourself the question, am I willing to pay the price? Am I willing to humble myself under the mighty hand of God and say, tonight, God gets all of me? 
It's like our dear brother said, it's going to take more than one meeting to get to the bottom of this. We're only asking the question tonight. But over the next few months, we are all going to have to answer it. Is God going to get all of me or not? I'll never forget the story that Brother Brian told. And I've called him twice and asked him the name, and I just can't ever remember the man's name. But he's sitting on a stump out in the, out in the, the country, and he's praying to God, and Jesus shows up. And walks up to him and holds out his hand. And the man that is sitting on the stump knows what he wants. He had one place in his heart that he, he just wasn't surrendering. And Jesus said, give me the key. I want the key to that room in your heart. And he said, Jesus, I don't let anybody go there. I don't even go there myself. He said, I've tried to hide that. I've tried to lock it up. I don't want anybody to know about it. I don't want anybody to see it. And I just don't want, I don't want it. I don't know. Jesus, anything but that. And Jesus turned around and began to walk away. And the man began to cry after him. He said, Lord Jesus, please don't leave. And Jesus turned around and he said, I either have all of your heart or I have none of it. And so the man reached out his hands, reached out his hand, and said, take it, Lord Jesus. And God used that man so powerfully. I'm uncertain why it is such a hard question to answer. I cannot explain it. Because Jesus himself told us, he said, whatever you give up for me and my kingdom, whether it's wives or husbands or children or houses, whatever you give up, I will give you in this life a hundred times with persecutions. Isn't that an odd thing? I'm going to bless you and you're going to be persecuted. You know they call us nuts. You know people don't understand these things. And to be honest, I don't understand all these things. But I know Jesus is looking for a surrendered saint. We sing about it. Every time Brother Routon comes, he sings the song, I Surrender All. But I've got to be honest. I have not. Have you? I have. There's more of me that he can have. So let's say it to our feet. It's going to take more than one meeting. But you know Jesus is big enough that he can fix it in one meeting. <laughs> I can't find a single account of a man or a woman that gave all to Jesus that Jesus did not use in a huge way. Some of them have been hidden there are people that spent 60 years in a, on a mission field and saw not a single convert. But the next missionary that came in after they died, I mean, thousands upon thousands were converted. That man, that woman, they gave their life. They gave all for Jesus. And they didn't see the harvest. I'm sure my great-grandmother would have loved to have heard me preach. But the reason that I preach is because she prayed. So what are we going to do with this? I'm telling you, I've been struggling with it for three days. I asked.
asked where I yesterday. I said, are you ready to leave this church? Because I don't know if I can in what God wants to do here. He said, I'm ready. He said, but it's not time. That's how serious it is. God wants to move you. He has told us again and again. But we got to be surrendered to the place that we can carry the weight of the glory. Jesus, help us. Help us. I don't know that we'll ever figure it out, God. William Booth said, I don't know. The preacher you used in that revival in Scotland, he said, I don't know. Lord, I come to you tonight and I say, I don't know. But I do know that there's more of me than I have ever given you. And I know, God, there's this, there's this dilemma within all of us. We could have prayed more. We could have done more. We could have fasted more. That's, it's a reality for all of us. And so that's not what I'm talking about, Lord. I'm asking you, Lord, what is the price that needs to be paid? What is the sacrifice on our part that you're looking for? What is the baptism that we are to be baptized with? And I'm just being honest, Lord. I, I'm not as bold as James and John. When you asked them, they said, we are able. I'm saying, will you help me? <laughs> because I need it. Will you help me, Lord? Will you help me surrender, Lord? Will you help me surrender completely? Jesus, we love you. We want to see the lives changed that you said you're going to change. And we thank you for every answered prayer that you have given. And right now, God, in the midst of our frailties, in the midst of our uncertainties, in the midst of this transition, in the midst of this transformation, we lift our hands and we praise you. God, we praise you. We praise you, God. We praise you, God. We give you glory, Father. We give you glory in your house, God. Lord, we praise you that you would inhabit our praises, that you would take your rightful place on the throne of our hearts. God, we desire that you reign and rule in us as king. And so we praise you. We praise you, God. We praise you, God. We praise you and we give you glory. Oh, we pray that you move according to your will, according to your purpose, God. That you just help us find that place of perfect submission and perfect rest. That you help us find that place of surrender to your will. And we pray it in the lovely name of Jesus. Thank you. If you're watching via technology and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you're in this room and you've never made Jesus Lord, what I'm talking about tonight is not salvation. Jesus paid for heaven. Heaven is paid for. Jesus paid the price for your and my sin. And we receive that by faith. I'm, I'm talking about something totally different. I'm talking about consecration tonight. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about people being used by God to reach out to people that don't know Jesus. So if you're watching this and you don't know Jesus, heaven is paid for. The gospel is good news. You receive that by faith. 
The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe that God raised him from the dead. We believe that in our heart and out of our mouth. We confess it. The Bible says if we do that, we shall be saved. There will be a transformation, a changing of your mind, a changing of your heart. God will take out the old heart and give you a brand new one and give you a brand new start. He is good. The gospel is good. And I know this is kind of a heavy sermon tonight, but I'm just telling you, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about a people that will be used by God to transform a nation. You think that's going to be easy? It's not going to be easy. The, the gospel is easy. It is good news because Jesus already did the hard part. He's already paid the price for sin. So if you've never accepted Christ, accept him. Be the best decision you've ever made. Find you somebody and tell them, I gave my heart to Jesus tonight. If it's your wife, your husband, call me, 918-519-7529. I'll talk with you. I'll pray with you. I got my phone in my back pocket. I'll answer it right now. God bless you. We thank you, all of you that are watching. And I pray that you, you determine that you're going to live this consecrated life, this surrendered life. Barnstall needs you. Tulsa needs you. Claremore needs you. Uh, Hominy, Winona, Pahuska, Avant, Sky to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, the USA, they need you. Amen. This country needs a church that is living a surrendered life so they can carry the weight of God to a lost and a broken world. God bless you. We love you. In Jesus' name.